So this is the solutions to Phys 1121 practice test 2. So in problem A, we've got a bullet which is being shot directly upwards and then it passes through the centre of mass of a 5 kilogram block which is initially at rest. So here we go, we have our bullet coming upwards and it's being shot into this block here. This is 5 kilograms and the bullet has a mass of 10 grams. And we're told after the collision, the block the, and the bullet is moving directly upwards at 400 meters per second. So this is initial. And afterwards, the bullet is going up like this with a speed of 400 meters per second. And the block is moving somehow. So in part one, we're asked to calculate the velocity of the block immediately after the bullet has passed through it and state any assumptions you make when performing this calculation. Okay, so this is final. So we're going to assume that because this is a collision, the external forces are negligible during the collision, so momentum is conserved. So assume external forces So if we're making this assumption, we can write down that the mass of the bullet times the initial speed of the bullet, and then we'd have to add on the mass of the block times the initial speed of the block, I'll give the block a capital B and a capital M, is equal to the final speed of the bullet times the mass of the bullet plus the mass of the block times the final speed of the block. So in this case, the block is initially at rest. So this term here is zero. And we're trying to find the final speed of the block. So we can write, well, the mass of the block times the final speed of the block is equal to the mass of the bullet. And I'm going to move this term over here. And the mass of the bullet is a common factor. So I'll put UB minus VB. And so I can say the final speed of the bullet is equal to mb ub minus vb over the mass of the block. And now we can substitute in the numbers. The bullet is 10 grams, so that's 10 to the minus 3 kilograms. The initial speed of the bullet, we're told in the question, I should have drawn it here, is 1,000 meters per second. So this is 1,000 minus 400. And then we're dividing by the mass of the block, which is the 5 kilograms. So when we solve this, we get 1.2, and that's meters per second. And it's moving upwards, because this is positive, and we've taken upwards as our positive direction, so upwards. Now in part 2 of this question, we're asked to calculate the maximum height to which the block will rise above the table. Okay, so to get that, we'll assume that once the bullet passes through the block, that non-conservative forces aren't doing any work. So we can assume that mechanical energy is conserved. So mechanical energy is conserved after the bullet passes. as non-conservative forces do no work. So we can assume that the initial kinetic energy, which is what we're referring to as final here, because we're talking about initially after it's just passed through the block, and then we want to find out how high is this block going to rise. So this will be our new final. And this is the initial for this question. 
So we can say, well, initially, this just has kinetic energy. So we can say the initial potential plus the initial kinetic is equal to the final potential plus the final kinetic. And at the maximum height, it's got zero speed. So it's got no final kinetic energy. And initially, we can say it's at height zero. So it's got no potential energy. So initially, we've got a half the mass of the block times the velocity of the block squared, which we've just calculated up here, is equal to the final potential energy, which is just given by m g h and this is the mass of the block so these two masses are the same thing so we can cancel out those masses of the blocks and so we can get well h is going to be equal to a half v b squared on g so that's equal to a half times 1.2 squared over 9.8 and solving that we get 0 0.073 meters. So we can leave it that way, or we can say, well, this is equal to 7.3 centimeters. Okay, so now we've solved this problem, let's look at how it would be marked. We get one mark for stating that momentum is conserved and why. We get one point for interpreting this, equa this statement as an equation. So that's what we've done here. We then get a mark for correctly substituting in and another for correctly solving it to get the correct final answer. Now for part two, we'd get a mark for saying that mechanical energy is conserved. So either with this statement or this equation here. We get another mark for justifying this. It didn't ask us to justify this. So you don't absolutely have to do this to get this mark. But if you do justify it and then you get the wrong, the final answer wrong, you will get that mark. And then we've got one mark for substituting in correctly here and another mark for the correct final answer. This is problem B. So in this problem, we've got a space station which is shaped like a disc. And in the first part of this problem, we're asked about what the required rotation period is in order for people on this space station to feel G acceleration due to gravity similar to what we have on Earth. So let's draw a little diagram over here. We've got this space station which is a disc and we're talking about a distance d away from the center of this disc and the disc has a radius r and we're told that r is equal to 100 meters and what we want to know is the period so in order to have an acceleration similar to the acceleration due to gravity, what we need is a centripetal acceleration for a person standing on the edge of the disc like this towards the center, which has the same magnitude as the acceleration due to gravity. So we need that our centripetal acceleration is equal to g. And we know that the centripetal acceleration is given by v squared on r or omega squared r. So from this, we can work out what omega is, and we know that omega is related to the period through omega is equal to 2 pi over the period. So we can say, well, g is equal to 2 pi on t squared times r. So this tells us that t squared is equal to 4 pi squared r on g. And so the period is going to be equal to 2 pi times the square root of r. Sorry, that r is the radius of the disk here, so it should really be a capital R. So let's put capital R on g. And then we can substitute in. So we've got 2 pi times the square root of 100 over 9.8. So that's approximately 10. But solving that on the calculator, we end up with 20 seconds. Okay, so in part two of this question, we're asked to come up with an expression for the mutual potential energy between the ring, which we're assuming has mass capital M, and a point out here with a mass little m. Well, not a point, a mass. 
So in order to do this, what we can do is consider a little bit of the ring, say down here, which has a mass dm. Now, if I was to sum up all the dms all around the ring, I'd just get the total mass of my ring, which is m. But let's just consider the contribution from this little part. And you can see the distance away from the center is r, and then this distance is d. So the distance between dm and m here is given by the square root of r squared plus d squared. So we know that our formula for gravitational potential energy is u is equal to minus g m1 m2 on r. So in this case, we could say, well, the contribution to the gravitational potential energy due to just dm is du. And that's going to be equal to minus g. We've got dm, and then we've got little m. And then we're dividing by the distance between these two things, which is the square root of r squared plus d squared. But we're not interested in just the contribution from dm. We want to know from the whole ring. And what's nice about the ring is that every point around the ring is the same distance from this little mass m. So they're all going to contribute in the same way. So we just want to integrate these things, sum, sum them all up. And so we end up with u is equal to minus g little m. When we sum all the dm's, as we mentioned, we get capital M, and then this is over the square root of r squared plus d squared. Okay, so let's look at how this would be marked. For the first question, either stating it or as an equation or in words that we expect the centripetal acceleration to be the same as the acceleration due to gravity is worth two marks. And then going through and solving this to get the period is worth another two marks. So for part two, we get one mark for realizing that we need to use this potential energy expression here. We'd get one point for realizing that this distance is always the same, however you manage to show that. So I've showed that by substituting it in here, one of those, but you may have written a comment about that. And then we get one mark for the final expression. So all together, this question is then out of seven marks. Okay, this is part C. So in this one, Isaac Newton, who fun fact, came up with his law of universal gravitation while stuck at home because of a viral outbreak, um, has miraculously returned to Earth and he's conducting an experiment with an apple in a lift. So let's draw a little diagram to show what's going on. So here's the apple and the apple is a position H above the floor. So this is H. So let's call the bottom of the lift y equals zero at t equals zero and the apple is at y equals h. So in the first part of this question, we're asked to plot an altitude of y against t, um, showing the position of the floor of the lift and also the apple. And we meant to go for times before zero two, so before it's released. So we'll make this our y-axis and we'll make our t-axis along here. And we've said that at t equals zero, y equals zero. So you don't have to choose that. You could define the height of the apple as zero if you wanted. But with the lift floor, we're told in the question that it's traveling upwards with a speed v. So it's going up with a constant velocity. So on a displacement time graph, the lift floor is going to have a constant gradient. So we can draw it that way and the gradient is equal to v. Now with the apple, let's draw that in red, it starts at h, so here's h. Before it is released, it just um, travels up with the lift at a constant speed v, so that's like this. And then once it's released, gravity acts to accelerate it downwards. So gravity is always acting on it, but gravity takes a little while to change its movement from upwards with the elevator to downwards. So this is going to be a parabolic path like this. So this is the apple and it's a parabola.
Now, part two of this question asks us to write an equation for the position of the floor of the lift corresponding to your graph. Okay, so we've got y is equal to vt. So that is 2. And I should just check that this corresponds with y equals 0 at t equals 0, which we can see it does. Part 3 then asks me to write an equation for the position of the apple corresponding to your graph. You need only write the equation for the time of its projectile motion, not before it is dropped or after it hits the floor. Okay, so we're just looking at this part of the graph here. So we can use our kinematic equations for this. The most useful one is s is equal to ut plus a half at squared. s, that's the displacement. So we're looking at the displacement in the y direction here. So um, this is the displacement from its initial position. And its initial position is h. So we can say um, initially y equals h. And we also know that the initial speed is equal to v, and we know that the acceleration is minus g, or minus 9.8 if we want a number, because it's downwards. So using this, we can say, well, y is going to be equal to the initial height, which is h, plus vt minus a half gt squared. Now part four, then ask, showing you're working explicitly, derive an expression for the time when it hits the floor. So the apple is going to hit the floor when the floor and the apple are at the same location. So to solve that, I'll need to have their y's the same. So I'll need y apple, which is what I found in part 3, equals y floor, which is what I found in part 2. So I can say h plus vt minus a half gt squared is equal to vt. Now you can see the vt's are going to cancel out and I'll have h is equal to a half gt squared. So I'm trying to find the time here. So t is equal to 2h on g and then take the square root. Okay, so now we've solved that problem, let's go ahead and mark it. So for this first part, the graph, you get one point for drawing the lift floor with a constant gradient. So one point for a nice straight line here. And one point for clearly showing the apple is the distance h above the floor at time zero. So we want this distance here being h, so that's one point. One point for the apple line at a constant gradient before t equals zero. So these lines should really be parallel. And then one point for the apple parabolic path after t equals zero. So one point for this. Um, for part two, we get one point for our equation. So something like this. I mean, if your floor was starting at minus h or something, you'd have y equals minus h plus vt, which is another possibility. Um, part two is worth two marks. So um, two marks for having this correct expression here. Now part four, one point for realizing that they must have the same y. And then you get two marks for correctly solving this. So altogether, this is out of 10 marks.